Does your thumb break? <laughs> um, work? It works. Why don't you bring it up? <laughs> Anyone else got the movie to show? My mesh is fine, so mine is still running. Hopefully I will show you later. Thank you very much, that was quite impressive. So as you know, life is not fair, right? Which means that I get to speak again and then you get to listen. But then we will do a revenge, right? Right now I will tell you about discretization best practice. And when we finish with that, then I'm going to ask you to do some programming for me. Okay? Do you have ideas for programming tasks that we should do? I get three groups. Right? The first group, for the beginners, we will take scalar transport form and we will search for the value uh, in a cell, print it out on a screen, print it out in a file. Okay? For the second group, I want, them, I want you to write a function object for me. Okay? In the pack that I send you for the training, there is already a library with some function objects. And that function object should calculate mean velocity in the domain. Okay? And for the third group, I want you to write me a total pressure boundary condition where the total pressure changes sinusoidally in time. Yeah? Too difficult? I'll take two out of three. Good. Okay. So, the title of the presentation is Finite Volume Discretization Best Practice Guideline. Okay? And there are two reasons why I want to do this talk. Number one, there is this legend that when I'm in the room, open phone works better. Okay? Meaning that for me, simulations work, and when I walk out, they don't work anymore or things that other people have been working on which are impossible get fixed in 20 minutes when I'm around. Okay? So here I will show you the tricks that I use and then we will go back to the NACA 0012 tutorial and do something completely stupid and then fix it step by step so that you have a feeling of how the code blows up and how to help yourself. Okay? The second is that in CFD, as in religions, there are different tastes in life, okay? So there are people who want to run like Fluent all the time. There are people who want to run like Star CCM Plus all the time. And this is particularly relevant for people who are using CFD codes in uh, an industrial environment and they are under pressure to produce the same results with open phone as they did with commercial codes, okay? The starting point, of course, is the finite volume discretization, okay? And I will assume that you know finite volume discretization. Is that okay? You know the basics? Divergence, gradient, upwind, differencing, blah, 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 okay? Now, 
The dirty secret is that the finite volume discretization written up in the book doesn't actually work that well. Okay, so as long as you're running down break on a column or a backward facing step and your smear mesh is well resolved and all the, chair, all the cells are nearly perfect, the results are okay. In industrial CFD, mesh is of one order of magnitude bigger than you're used to. The geometry has got a really complex shape. Making a mesh of any quality is already very difficult. And making a really good mesh is usually completely out of the question because the results need to be finished by 3 o'clock. Okay? So what I'm going to show you is, number one, that all these codes use the same basic discretization procedure. And number two, that there is a series of dirty tricks in discretization that nobody tells you about, okay? But they are used in all the commercial codes, okay? We will finish by proposing the default setting separately for hexahedral and tetrahedral meshes because they are slightly different, okay? Do you have a feeling of what is going on behind the scene in a commercial CFD company? Okay. These people make their money on the idea that an average person in average time with average knowledge on a really horrible mesh can produce a solution which is acceptable. Okay. Now, acceptable means it's not obviously garbage. Okay. With CFD, you can, of course, do much, much better, but in order to do that, you have to have the skills, okay? So, the codes have got very carefully chosen default settings. They will not tell you what these default <coughs> settings are. If you're lucky, you have a switch saying first order and second order, okay? And sometimes you have switches behind the scene, which will do, do, some, uh, do something completely uh, different. Okay, my favorite was at Star CD. That version of the code is no longer in regular use. We had switch 85. Okay, you know what it did? When the customer came and he said, well, I'm running this first order, and if I have to switch it to second order, the code is not converging or it's blowing up for me. Okay, then you try and argue and you find out what's going on. If you really can't fix it, you tell them, well, use switch 85. So what the switch does, it says, well, whatever difference in scheme you switch as a customer, put it back to first order. <laughs> okay? And then you say, well, now we switch 85, everything works. But as you can see, your results are exactly the same <laughs> as they were with the first order, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Now, that's not fair. Okay? So please keep in mind that this is a second order accurate code, but you need to have a reasonable mesh quality and if your meshes are really horrible, you have to make a compromise somewhere. Either make a better mesh or cut some corners in discretization. Okay, so with foam, the default settings are really poor. Why? Because out of 250 tutorials, most of them exist to show you what switches are available, and very few of them have been carefully tuned. Okay? The second thing is that Tuning a tutorial is not such an easy business because for simple foam, I have Pix Daily. This is a backward facing step with beautiful academic mesh. Everything is nicely aligned. And I have a motorbike which barely runs and produces a really rubbish solution. Okay? In reality, the code should have different settings depending on the mesh quality. And our focus is in producing the best result that we can on a given mesh and not producing an average result for an average uh, idiot on an average day. Okay? However, average idiot also requires a skill, okay? which means that it is possible to set up the codes to produce exactly the same answers in exactly the same time as you get with, say, CFX or Fluent or Star CCM+. Okay? Keep in mind that at the end of the day, all of these codes use the same discretization procedure, the same mesh handling, the same linear equation solvers, the same turbulence models, the same pressure velocity coupling algorithm, which means that in fairness they can be 15-20% faster or slower, but definitely not a factor of 10. Okay. <clears throat>
So now that I told you that our uh, tutorials are not that great, I have to tell you what we are doing to make this better. Okay? And in practice, there is quite a large validation exercise going on where PhD students, people from companies will donate the cases that will then go into automatic test loops. But in a serious CFD company, they will have five or 10,000 validation cases, and we have a much smaller number. Okay, so while this is getting on, please consider contributing. And also keep in mind the stuff that I have on different slides. Okay, so one of the biggest sources of discretization error in CFD is, of course, the mesh. And as I told you, you can expect to have a so-so mesh if you have time or if you're doing the same simulation over and over again. But in reality, you're turning over geometries fairly quickly and doing relatively routine simulations, and the amount of time that you have to create the mesh is limited. Okay? So what we are going to look at is how to fix separate discretization practices on gradient calculation, convection, diffusion, etc., to make it work well for your mesh. Okay? The first example for that is the gradient calculation scheme. Okay? So what, here I have written out the Gauss gradient calculation, which says that the volume integral of grad phi dv is equal to the surface integral ds times phi at the boundary. My computational cell has got a bunch of faces. Each of those faces have got a cell to the left and the right, which means that I calculate the gradient as the sum over the faces of the face area vector multiplied by the value of my variable at the face. So how do I get that value? Well, you have the value to the left of the face, value to the right of the face, and the face in the middle. You will do interpolation, in this case something like half of left and half of right, and get the value. Now, this method is second order accurate only if that integral is second order accurate, and in order to get it second order accurate, I use something called the midpoint rule. Meaning, if I want to integrate a linear function over the face, I will take the value at the centroid and multiply it by the face area. Okay? Now, what happens if the line between P and N doesn't go through the middle of the face? Well, your gradient is not second order accurate which is a little bit of a problem, but it is not a disaster. Unfortunately, accuracy of gradient calculation will kill me later. Okay? So for the cases where the mesh is distorted, I have to find myself a better discretization procedure. Okay. Now, on a hexahedral mesh, a cell will have six neighbors, right? So I can calculate that the gradient is right minus left over the distance times x, top minus bottom over the distance times y, front uh, uh, minus back over the distance times z, and that gives me a reasonable gradient. Okay? On a tetrahedral mesh, I don't have six neighbors, I only have four. And if you imagine what an irregular tetrahedral mesh would look like, my tetrahedra can get much more distorted than the, uh, than the hexahedra, which means that the miss between the face center and the interpolated value can be much bigger. Okay? So for that, I need to imagine a new way of calculating the gradient. Okay? So here's a little picture to help me with what's going on. So the idea is that I have a point P in 2D, and around it, I have a cloud of points n1 to n5. I know the value of phi p and the value of variable in all of the points around it. Do you have any idea of how would I calculate the gradient without referring to the Gauss's theorem and the finite volume method? Well, this is just a bunch of data, right? So I can fit a plane through the data take a look at the slope of that plane, and that's my gradient. Okay? 
the way that the least square fit is defined is I say, looking from my point P, the value at N is equal to the value at P plus this vector D multiplied by the gradient at P. Okay? Phi P plus D N dot grad Phi P. Will that actually be the value in N? No. Okay, so I will imagine myself there is an error, which says phi n minus the extrapolated value. And then I say that the least square fit minimizes the weighted sum of square of errors. Okay? And I get an expression like that, that I will derive with respect to grad phi p. And here I get an expression which says weight square g to the minus 1 dot dn phi n minus phi p. This is basically a geometry where the G tensor is defined from the sum of the DN tensors, and I can invert them. Okay. So what this basically does is it makes sure that I can get a second-order gradient even if my mesh is really ugly. Okay? Because there is no issue with interpolating into the face center anymore. But who tells you that that gradient is okay? No one. It's formally second order accurate, but this is not enough. Okay, so now consider a case that looks like this. Here's my function, should be a bit prettier, but this one will do for the moment. And I have three points. One point P <coughs> here, one point here, and one point here. Okay? How am I going to calculate the gradient in that point? Well, I will go right minus left over the distance. So whatever line I have from here to here, I can copy it, move it down here, and declare that this is a gradient. Right? Now, do you see a problem with that? Well, the problem is that as I move these points left and right, depending on the shape of the curve, my gradient can do whatever it likes. Okay? And I have no way of estimating whether my gradient is okay. So let's go back to our slides and figure out if I have a way of judging whether my gradient is okay. As I said, I have a point P and a bunch of points in my neighborhood. Okay, N1 to N5. And I have just calculated the gradient. I can go back to my expression and for each of the neighboring points say the value here, assuming that this gradient is good, is the value in the middle plus the extrapolated value to here. What I do then is I go back to the original data and I pick up the minimum and the maximum of my neighborhood. Okay? If the extrapolated value doesn't fall within the minimum and maximum of my neighborhood, I know that my gradient is bad. Okay? So in the example that I try to sketch quickly, the idea is that my function looks like this and I'm here at the bottom, and now my gradient can go left or right, depending on where the neighborhood of my point is, okay? But the extrapolated value with such a gradient will fall outside of the range of my value and all of my neighbors, okay? When I find a gradient like that, I will basically clip it. 
okay, saying all of the extrapolated values in my neighborhood need to stay between the min and the max of the values. Formally, this violates second order accuracy because I chopped off the gradient, but knowing the data from what is going on around me will actually help me. Okay? Consider my backward facing step mesh. Okay? You remember what the mesh looked like? There was a corner here, and then I pulled the mesh XY like this. Okay? What would have happened if I wanted the boundary layer and I wrapped it around the corner? Okay? Then I have a point here at the top and point behind the step, which is really not relevant for me because the flow is going in that direction, and that point is very far away from the neighborhood that I have. Okay? So the gradient at the most important point of my flow will be badly wrong. Okay? So the first thing that I can do with my gradients is do this neighborhood check, and rather than just using the Gauss or the least square gradient, I will use the limited version of that gradient. Okay, so that will make my gradient better, but what's such a big deal about my gradients? It turns out that gradients are very important in many other things. Okay, but before we do that, let us take a look at the way that convection discretization is discretized. Okay, so the volume integral of the div splits into a surface integral of the flux f, which is sf.uf, and the value of my variable at the face. Again, I have the left value, the right value, the value in the middle, and I am going to do interpolation, which is linear. Okay, remember the swirl test that we did yesterday? When I use this scheme, which is called central differencing, for my values in the simulation, I had values which are greater than 1 or less than 0. Well, what's the big deal? The problem is that some of the equations and some of the variables preserve the natural bounds that are defined to them by the mathematical model. For example, turbulence kinetic energy is the square of the velocity uh, fluctuation, and as a square, it cannot be negative. Okay? Number two, temperature. It cannot be negative, because when I use the equation of state, which says rho equals P over RT, negative temperature gives me negative density, and no, that's not a good idea. Okay? Number three, concentration or volume fraction. Can it be bigger than 100%? No, not even if you're a very talented football player. Okay? Now, negative concentration or concentration greater than 100% is actually very dangerous. Remember the presentation that we did this morning about rho in the VOF system? We said alpha times rho 1 plus 1 minus alpha times rho 2. If alpha is 0, 1.01, .01, I go alpha times 1 plus 1 minus alpha times 1,000. 1 minus 0 0.01 .01 is minus, uh, minus 1.01 .01 is minus 0 0.01 .01 times 1,000. My density is minus 9. Oops. Okay, negative density is the most certain way of blowing up your code. Now, why does that happen? Mathematically, this should never happen because the mathematical model clearly says that alpha concentration needs to stay between 0 and 1, that temperature must stay above 0, turbulence kinetic energy must remain positive. However, what we are doing is an approximation where we are creating the discretized form of my transport equation, and along the way, we lost the connection with the physics. Okay? <coughs> so the point of the message is that when you're choosing convection discretization, because central differencing and related schemes 
do not recognize the bounds, you have to think about the variable that you're transporting. Okay? Yesterday I also showed you upwind differencing, which says if the flux is positive, take the upwind value, uh, take the p-value. If the flux is negative, takes the uh, n-value and sort out the problem. Okay? Now, if I'm transporting k or alpha, etc., it is more important for me to keep the values bounded than it is to get high accuracy because negative temperature leads to negative density and I never get to convergence because the solution blows up. What about the velocity? Well, velocity components are not bounded variables because they can go from minus infinity to plus infinity smoothly through zero. Okay? So for those properties that do not have the bounds, I want to use a nice discretization scheme. And it turns out that the one that I use all the time is linear upwinding. Do you know what it does? It will find the upwind cell, and then it will extrapolate to the face from the upwind side. And it works really well. Why? I have no idea, but it really works well. OK. So now that we have done the convection operator, let us take a look at the choice of schemes that come with it. Okay? Typically, upwind scheme is not good enough if you want to produce something of high accuracy, but we are, uh, if we are in the business of the average idiot on an average day on a really bad mesh, then upwind is not such a bad choice. Okay? There is a whole series of schemes in open form. I think we have about 45 of them, which are a combination of first order and second order schemes, which will dynamically blend between upwind and central depending on the curvature of the solution. Okay, so what I have here is the value in the C cell, which is the upwind cell of my face. D is the downwind cell. And U is the quote-unquote far upwind cell. If you're on a hexahedral mesh, this actually exists, and you can take a look at two cells upstream. But from the point of view of code organization, it never works like that, because what happens if U is on a different process, right? Uh, if the accuracy is important, and you're solving to uh, a variable which is bounded, you can choose one of these big families of TVD and NBD schemes, hoping that it will improve your convergence. But which one? Okay, the fact that there are 45 of them means that people don't know what they're doing. Okay, the difference between one and the other will be one, two, three percent, and in the great scheme of things, it really makes no difference. Okay. So when you get into a situation where you have to transport passive scalars to uh, bounded scalars to second order accuracy, pick one scheme and stick with it. You will not make a big mistake. Okay? So the message from convection discretization is number one, think. What variables are bounded? What are not bounded? Okay? When you have a bounded variable, start by using upwind differencing on it. For unbounded variables like velocity, linear upwind is my default choice, and it's been like that for quite a long time, and it works well. If you find that your solution is too diffusive and upwind differencing doesn't give you any trouble, then try and switch to your favorite second order scheme. My favorite scheme is one Lear at the moment. Okay. In foam, we also have a family of second order schemes for special purposes. Okay? I told you before that, for example, in VOF, it is very important for me for the gradient to be sharp, but I cannot tolerate unboundedness either below zero or above one. Okay? So in the moment of inspiration, we came up with a set of schemes that end with zero one. Okay? The idea is this. I know how to make my variable bounded unconditionally, which is to use upwind. Okay? 
And what the zero one schemes do is they will use the basic scheme like gamma or one layer or whatever you choose and follow any unboundedness fluctuations. Okay, so if you find that your variable is unbounded to 1.000001 or minus 10 to the minus 16, the scheme will say, well, there's something strange going on here. I better switch to upwind, but only on this face. Right? So the number of faces where it will do that uh, intervention is extremely small, but because it will eliminate the error where it is created, it actually really helps with the convergence. Okay? So if you have uh, concentration or volume fraction or some other variable like that, use the zero one one scheme. What happens if you use it on K or some other variable like that? It's not a disaster, right? If your variable goes above one, it will switch to upwind, and you'll probably not notice because that's the old switch 85 trick. Okay, so now that we have done the convection part of the story, what about the diffusion? In order to understand the diffusion, I have to show you something about mesh non-orthogonality. Okay, so in the discretization of the finite volume Laplacian operator, I will end up with a sum over the faces gamma at the face, which is my diffusivity factor, SF, which is the face area vector, dotting the gradient of my variable phi at the face. Okay, so here I will know the value of my variable at point P and at point N, and if you ask me for the value of the gradient in that direction, that's easy. Value at N minus the value at P divided by the distance, right? Well, there is a little problem, and that is that this term here says that you have to take a look at the gradient in the direction of face area, okay? So if my face area, sorry, if my face was like this, then the face area vector would be parallel with green, and there would be no problem, okay? This is what we call zero degrees non-orthogonality, okay? In reality, there will be an angle between the vector between P and N and the face normal vector S, and that's this angle here. Can you tell me how much it is on the screen? 30 degrees, fair? Okay, now remember check mesh. It complained when the angle between these two vectors was greater than 70 degrees. Okay, and I told you, foam will happily run with 85, 88. At 88, I start getting worried. But I've seen meshes where that, uh, that angle is 110. Okay, well, that's a problem, right? Because that means that the cell is inside out and there's something terribly wrong with your mesh. Uh, fortunately, we have fixed parts of the discretization to make it work even if the angle is greater than 90 degrees, but you have to keep in mind that this mesh is formally invalid. Okay? So how is this done? Okay? So the joke basically says if you're walking through the jungle with a gun for pink elephants and you see a grey elephant, you paint it pink and then you shoot it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say the PNN Give me the gradient in the direction of D. So I will decompose my face area vector delta, sorry, S into delta, which is parallel with D, and K, which is the correction such that this angle here is 90 degrees. Right? As the angle gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, my delta gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and this is what I was trying to achieve. Okay? Now, the discretization comes in two parts. The first part is mag S over mag D phi n minus phi P. And the second part is K, which is that vector, multiplied by the gradient of my variable here. So how do I get the gradient in the middle of the face? Well, I calculate the gradient in the left cell center, 
I'll calculate the gradient in the right cell center. I interpolate it onto the face. Right. Now here, you can see the danger of a bad gradient. What if my gradient in the, bad in the right cell is bad? Then my non-orthogonal correction is going to be quite large. Okay? So this is the second cause of problems on the mesh, because that term, called the non-orthogonal correction, is basically either a source term or a sink term, and it can be big or small depending on how good my gradient is. Now, uh, when we are doing the discretization of source and sink terms, we are really quite careful about it. Okay? So the source terms will be made implicit, explicit, meaning however you want to raise the, vari uh, the value of the variable, everything is fine, but the sync terms will be made implicit. Okay? Now what does that mean? You know the turbulence kinetic energy equation. I showed it on the first day. It says dk by dt plus dv k minus dv nu effective grad k equals g minus epsilon. And g is my generation term, which is basically turbulent viscosity multiplied by the square of the velocity gradient. And epsilon is the destruction of k. Okay? That means that if I use epsilon, which is badly estimated, I can drive my k to go negative. And this is not something that I want to allow. So I use a little trick called the curious property of an empty box. Okay? What I mean is that as I'm solving for k, and k is approaching zero, my sink term epsilon must approach zero as well. Okay? Because at k is zero, I have no more k to take out of that cell. Okay? So the curious property of an empty box says there is nothing that you can take out of it. So the number of rabbits in an empty box can never become negative. Okay? So the discretization for that g minus epsilon will say something like g minus epsilon old over k old times k nu. Okay? And as k nu goes to zero, the sink term goes to zero as well, which means that I can never get negative k. Okay? And this is done as standard practice in the handling of source and sink terms. We have various operators like FVM SP and indeed FVM SUSP, which will do that for you that you will see in the code. Now, how does that relate to my non-orthogonality term here? Well, it can be big, it can be small, it can be positive, it can be negative, I really don't know. So I should treat it as a source and a sink, but I cannot, because this is a diffusion operator, and the form of the matrix is exactly what it should be. Okay? So instead of switching it between the source and the sink, I will do another little trick like I did before. And the trick basically says, find out whether the explicit correction term is bigger or smaller than the implicit part. Okay? So the idea is that if there is a lot of diffusive gradient in the normal direction, I will allow lots of diffusive gradient in the tangential direction of the face. But if in the normal direction there is very little diffusive transport, it is likely that my gradient is poor. So I will take the explicit correction term and chop it off so that it is always smaller than the implicit part. For some reason, that guarantees boundedness of my variable phi, and mathematically, there is no criteria which will show you that. But it works. Okay? Finally, we can set up 
the settings for this case to see how to approach something new. Okay. Number one, if your mesh is hexahedral, you can use a Gauss scheme for the gradients or Gauss with limiters. Remember the limiters? So when I sit in the point and I calculate the gradient, I will check whether the extrapolated value with the gradient that I calculated remains within the bounds of my neighborhood. If it does, I keep the gradient. If it does not, I clip it to make sure that the extrapolated value stays the same. Okay? This is no longer a second order gradient. However, it is more accurate than what I had because I have eliminated a part of the error. Number two, when I start playing with convection schemes, I will always start with upwind. Why? Because I'm solving an unknown problem on an unknown mesh quality, and if upwind doesn't work, then there is something seriously wrong with my case. So what could be wrong? Stupid initial conditions, stupid boundary conditions, wrong solver tolerances, I have mixed up inlets and outlets or something like that. Okay. For bounded variables, I must use upwind. For the momentum equation, I will typically start with linear upwind. Will you use linear upwind for k and epsilon? No, because they are extrapolated schemes, which means that the bounds are not satisfied. Okay. For the diffusion term, if your non-orthogonality is below 60 degrees, you can use a scheme called Gauss Linear Corrected, which basically says whatever correction you had on the right-hand side, you will put into the source. For higher non-orthogonality, you will use this limited scheme, and a factor of 0 0.5 says that the implicit and the explicit part can be the same. Okay? In all cases, you will monitor the boundedness of scalars. So what does that mean? When you're running VOF, make sure that the max alpha is not 3.7, and that mean alpha is not minus 0 0.3, because you're definitely doing something wrong. Okay? When you get into that mode of taking a look at your case and analyzing what's going on, it will be much easier for you to figure out what the case is doing. For tetrahedral meshes, we have slightly different settings. Number one, the Gauss gradient is not good enough because the neighborhood is minimum. Every tet has got only four neighbors if you're lucky. Okay, if you have a tet in the corner with three walls at the boundary, you only have one neighbor. Okay, well that is a dead cell that's just making your domain look pretty. Okay, number two, when I'm using a gradient scheme, I will typically use least square, in many cases without limiters. Okay? For convection schemes, I will start with upwind. Why? Because the mesh quality is so much lower for tetrahedral meshes, but the solution may still be okay. Because you can afford many more tetrahedral cells than hexahedral cells, because the mesh with tetrahedral faces cells has got uh, fewer internal faces. Okay? And finally, on diffusion scheme, I always use non-orthogonality limiters because I know that my meshes are highly non-orthogonal. Okay? Typical non-orthogonality on an industrial TET mesh, 85, 88 degrees, no questions asked. Okay. If you stick to this part of the story, most of your problems will be eliminated. You can still mess up inlet and outlet conditions, relaxation factors, solver tolerances, number of piezo correctors, etc. But for those, I don't have strict rules like I had here. But basically, you have to do a sport called residual gazing. Okay, so while your run is running, you have to monitor what's going on until you get enough confidence of doing this sort of cases or that sort of geometry so that you can start 20 runs overnight and make sure that all 20 of them are alive. So what I would like you to do now is to go back to the NACA 0012 case
make a copy and set all the discretization parameters to default. Okay? So Gauss gradient without a correction, corrected Laplacian, uh, bound layer on all of the uh, bounded scalars, and central differencing on momentum, and let's see how far we're going to get. We said Gradsky, Gauss linear. <laughs> 
I can't make it fail. Okay, so I have to go back to the engine cooling case because that has got a much nastier mesh. I have switched the discotization to second order but still use linear upwind and the best I got is this bounding K and bounding error message, uh, epsilon messages. So if you see that, there is obviously something wrong with the discretization. And now while the code is running, I will switch it to something more reasonable, hoping that the messages will go away. See here, bounding messages. In the next time step, it says, I reread your discretization. Bounding messages. Few time steps afterwards, only one bounding message. Okay, go back here, switch the case scheme upwind. Oops. <coughs> 
my bounding messages are gone. Okay, I would have thought that it was easier to knock this over, but obviously the code is getting a little bit better than I was aware. Okay, uh, there is one more thing that I quite regularly do in my runs, and that is the use of function object called min max field. So what I do here is in system control dictionary slash functions. Actually, I have to show you properly. <clears throat> I will give it this part, which says, please report on the screen the minimum and maximum of u, p, k, and epsilon at every iteration. And here, when you look at it, you can immediately find out whether your fields are behaving or not. Okay, so this is a flow for an engine block. I expect 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 meters per second, but not 200. Okay, I can immediately see it here. With the pressure, 180, 1000, K, 85. Well, that's dubious because K of 85 would be a lots and lots of turbulence. But this is quite a coarse and ugly mesh, so it is possible that it will still survive. Okay? Function objects are wonderful things. There is a guy called Bernhard Scheider who writes his function objects more and more complicated. For the cluster owners like our hosts here, it is nice to have something like, if you find that the maximum velocity goes above 1,000 meters per second, something's obviously gone wrong, kill the run. Let somebody else run it, okay? Bernhard will take this further and say, function object will send me an email saying, dear Bernhard, something's gone wrong with your run. Why don't you go into the office and find out? <laughs> and people say, once you get to the level of the code sending email messages, you're going too far. <laughs> okay. So let's have a little break. And after the break, we'll start doing some programming, okay? How many of you have done some basic programming with OpenFOAM? Everybody. Okay. In that case, uh, I'll do a little bit of introduction, and then I will ask you to do things, ideally with that dumb break problem that you were run. Okay? Cup of coffee, I think. Thank you.